Now to speak to you today, we have the keynote address made by our very own Vice Chairman, Dr. Saryu Doshi. She is a person of so many facets that it's difficult to put it in a small capsule. Nevertheless, I will try to tell you where she comes from. Dr. Saryu Doshi who is very well known to you as our Vice Chairman. Elected for the second time, Dr. Doshi is an eminent scholar in Indian classical and contemporary art and has a doctorate in ancient Indian history and culture from the University of Bombay and thereafter did her postdoctoral research at the University of Chicago, USA. She was the honorary director of the National Gallery of Modern Art, Bombay, which is a government organization from 1996 to 2005. She was also the pro tem cha chairman of the Lalit Kala Academy from 1999 to 2002 and from 1881 to 1986. She was the editor of Marg Publications. She has been a visiting professor at the University of Michigan and the University of California, Berkeley, USA. Among the awards received by Dr. Doshi are the Padma Shri Award in 1999, the award of the Star of Italian Solidarity by the Italian government for her contribution towards promoting Italian culture in India 2006, and Lifetime Contribution Award by the Art Society of India. Dr. Doshi will speak to you on the Palyas of Gujarat, Memorials of Valor and Sacrifice, and we look forward eagerly to her talk. Dr. Doshi, please. Uh, thank you, Member Secretary, Dr. Mishra. I am indeed very grateful for the invitation to come here and talk to these wonderful people who are doing such good work in their constituencies, so to say. And I am looking forward to seeing some of the work they do in various places. Today I'm going to talk about an institution which is very deep rooted in our culture. These are known as memorial stones or commemorative tablets. <clears throat> this uh, particular tradition is very, very deep rooted, as I said, and my attention to it was drawn not as a tradition, but as something that you see in the countryside. I was uh, a young girl of about 13 when we were traveling to Savarashtra, the family was going for a family wedding in there. And as we were traveling, we saw these stones that we see here. And these are tablets or commemorative uh, stones only they are known as. And uh, they look like uh, roadside signs if you notice, you know, I think there is some some sort of uniformity when something is to be conveyed. So this is the type of stones that you see. And my father remarked to me that these are known as palyas because they are guardians of the village. The word palya comes from pal, which is guardian. Now this was just something interesting and a little information that was given to me. And then when I got deeper into the study of Indian art and culture, I found that uh, there was much more to it than what we had thought. So, can I have, oh dear. I'm not very good at this, so please, where is he gone? Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, next. Next. Ah, ah, so, this tradition has existed. No, there's one before. Sorry. Piche, piche. These, these two paintings are from the Bhagavad Puran. And what you see is on the top a battle scene where people are fighting. And then what you see are women committing sati of the dead heroes. So this is 
from the Bhagavad Puran, which is important because these come, ideas come from Mahabharata as well as Ramayana. So they're centuries old. And the idea is that those who die on the battlefield will be, it's a great meritorious act, and they will be rewarded in heaven. Not only will they be received in heaven by celestial maidens, but they will also live forever in bliss and in comfort and will be known on the earth as a celebrity. So these were the inducements given to people to fight. Now, the reason for these inducements was that in those days, there was a lot of turmoil. You know, there were conquests and invaders and skirmishes and cattle raids and things like that. So the people had to fight. And for them to have some moral backing to do it and to sacrifice their life, they these these epics and these older, uh, older texts. For example, Manu Smriti says that to die on the battlefield as, is as meritorious as doing a sacrifice like Ashwamedh. You see, these are the sort of ideas they gave people. They inspired them. They were extolled and they were therefore ready to give their lives. Actually, it was a matter of dishonor to have not died on the battlefield because it showed cowardice. And when they died, their wives also committed sati because they didn't want to be seen as living without their husbands. So this is the institution that was that was there from ancient times and it was it was celebrated throughout the Middle Ages. And what we see is today I'm going to show you st uh, memorial stones from various parts of India and over various periods of time, which give you some idea of what the thinking was and what sort of tradition it represented. Uh, next. Oh, sorry. Please, I'm getting, uh, uh, this is the one. Now, the first one that you see is a Buddhist stone. It is a stone of a queen, and it was found in a temple there, here. And she, sorry, I'm not very good at this. Anyway, you see this, just remove, remove, the, remove this. That's okay. And this is what I'll do. Ah, it's a Buddhist queen, and her stone was found there at Nagarjuni Konda at Andhra Pradesh. Now, if you see, what I'm trying to show you is a period when this, as far back as 3rd century BC. Then the next one we see is a stone from Karnatak, which is a battle scene. You can see the hero battling and then dying, and then he's received in heaven by celestial maidens, and then he's sitting doing Shiva Puja in heaven amongst divinities. So this is the inducement that was given to people who died. Here is another one, the next one, that is also from Karnataka, 12th century, and these are about four to five feet high, this particular one. And this is a man who died in a cattle raid. And you can see cows below in the lowermost register. And he is fighting to save them. Then he is still shown fighting. And then he is shown re being received in heaven and then praying at the Shivalinga. Similarly, this third one, fourth one, is again a battle scene, more clearly depicting, and this is from Andhra Pradesh, Nagarjuni no, sorry, from Andhra Pradesh, Tilangana. And here he's fighting, then he's received in heaven by these beautiful, very, uh, very beautiful apsaras, and then on top he's seated amongst divinities. The fourth one is a wooden one, and it's a tribal one. So this tradition was also there in the tribes of India. And the last one is a current one, where a person is painted the last one. He's, so I'm showing you the development of, or the existence of hero stones from 3rd century BC till 20th century AD. And all these, the reasons are heroism of some sort or the other, which was being commemorated. Then we come to stones that were done for religious purposes. 
The first one that we see is again a prince who died in or in the service of religion. We don't have the details, but we know all this. And that's again from Andhra Pradesh. The one next to it is a, is a Hindu one where a man sacrifices his head as puja to Shivalinga. So this is, these are people who just do that as part of their holy rites. Then the lower one below that is that of a sati. And the sati is usually represented it's from Goa. So we've seen Andhra Pradesh, we've seen Gujarat, the man cutting his head off. Now we see Goa where the sati is shown with her right hand blessing. And she is represented as a pillar. In another place like Karnatak, they're shown as human women who have died and are blessing the people. The sati uh, tradition was quite, quite a difficult one. And uh, these satis often, the pyre was often surrounded by a curtain. So as the sati, the woman who was going to immolate herself approached it, she, she would not see everything and she would not get frightened. So she was protected by a curtain and then she entered the fire. But before she entered the fire, she would bless all the people who had assembled there. Also, very interestingly, very often they carried a pot of oil on their heads, which they broke as they entered the fire, because that would help, help them get burnt quicker. The, last, the next one is of footprints. That's a giant stone. And this stone is, represents Chandragupta Maurya at Shravan Birgula near Mysore. Chandragupta Maurya became a Jain towards the end of his life and he migrated to South India during a famine with his Jain guru. And there he lived for many years and then in a typical way of a Jain is that uh, uh, do salekhana, which is slowly starving yourself to death. But it's a ritual and it is done in a very systematic manner and done under the guidance of monks. So he died in that manner and he is commemorated by this symbol of footprints. Now below that are two stones that you see together. That is a man who is cutting his head off and sati. So this is husband and wife. But this person is not offering his head. What he is doing is doing what is known in Gujarat as Traga. He's a charan and he's the conscience keeper of the king there. So when he sees that there is a lot of misrule, that people are unhappy and he cannot get the king to understand it by just talking to him, then he sacrifices himself uh, by immolating himself and walking as a burning figure through the village street. And therefore, this is known as Traga. And no king wants a Traga stone. So these are very rare to find in Saurashtra because he doesn't want any symbol that represents his misrule. Next one. No. Yeah. This one. And do it with the curse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, again, we have a similar stone that I showed you from Karnatak of a man fighting and dying, going up to heaven, and then seated with divinities in heaven. And it's a beautifully uh, carved stone, and it comes, it's about 14th century, and it's from South India. South India has preserved many of these stones, and uh, they had a lot of them during the early era of the uh, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, because there were many kingdoms and there were a lot of fights and, uh, you know, ambitions, territorial ambitions. So a lot of people died on the battlefield. But the next one that is there is a giant stone, but it shows a woman fighting. And then she's seated alone in heaven and then seated with the giant Tirthankar in heaven. The third one again here is from Karnatak. All these three are from Karnatak. He, this is a cattle raid. You can see the cattle below. 
while he is fighting for it, then in heaven, and then again with the Shibli. So the iconography is the same, but the treatment and the way in which it is drawn is different. The next one is fighting at sea. So you see people in, in boats fighting with each other, and the ones who were dead were carried into heaven, and then you see them in heaven. But it's interesting iconography is there is a big kumb on top of the stone. So as art historians, we are very interested in seeing how differently it is represented. Then we see a, a person who is commemorated, who was an ordinary person. He was not royalty or even a chieftain or something. He's a person who is a foot soldier fighting. And below that is that of a pet, a dog who, was, who must have been very loyal and is remembered by the people. Mm. Now, no, this is not the one, yeah. Now I come specifically to Savarashtra, which is where you get a number of stones. They're very well preserved because people are very devout in this manner. And you see them in pavilions. The royal ones are in pavilions. The ordinary people, uh, stones are uh, inside, inside the pavilions. And then you see some of them in temple walls outside the temple, some at the boundary of the village, and then some on under actually in the uh, in the under trees and um, among bushes. So these are quite found very often outside villages of towns, and uh, they're preserved and they're looked after. And there are many stories and legends connected with this. And that is where my talk today centers on stones that, memorial stones that were preserved because there are legends connected with it. The stones may, lay, uh, may still be there, they may not be there, but the legends continue as songs and folklore. And that is our intangible heritage. And that is what we have to preserve, help, in, in uh, continuing it and teaching it to the children of that society. There's he gone. These are the people of Saurashtra. I thought I would give you some idea of the place, music. And... Go uh, on. Anyway, this is the main point of my talk that I'm talking to you today. This particular stone here that we see, the horseman done with red, is Hamir Ji Gohil. He was a young man who died in trying to save the Syamuna temple from the sultans who came invading. And he is supposed to have been uh, have very few soldiers with him. He knew he was going to die, but he said, I will go to the uh, to save Somnath, whatever I can do. What is it? Is? If we don't touch anything, we'll do it from there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Things have gone a little... Ah. This is, these are the people, and this is the song. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is... I think I was a bit too ambitious. <laughs> I just wanted to give you uh, an atmosphere of the place. They are doing it, can I control it? Yes, you can control it. No, this no. no you can. So this is, these are the ballads and the way in which they are sung. Now I'm coming to a very important point here. 
I'm talking about the legends, the intangible heritage that I wanted to talk about, the legends of these people. The first two slides on the left are of a horseman. This represents Hamirji Gohil, who was a chieftain. He was a small sort of kingdom, a king of that area. He went to Somnath to protect it from the invading Islamic armies. And he, it is said that he, uh, he fought so furiously and so bravely that his head was cut off and it fell off at one place, but his body kept off fighting, fighting and it went for another half a mile or so. And that is where the stone is erected with the horse on it. So the distance between the fight, uh, his his death of his head being cut off and his body dying is about half a mile. And he was fighting all the time. The next stone represents a snake. Now, there's a very beautiful legend about this snake in uh, that area. It says that there were two villages who were constantly bickering about the boundary between them. So then one day the elders decided that on a certain day at a certain time they will meet from both sides and between them draw the boundary. As they were standing there and deciding what to do, they saw a snake coming out of its hole and it was a cobra. So they all bowed to it and said, Nag Devtaji, you tell us how we should draw this boundary. So the Nag apparently obliged and he went across the uh, land and they were very pleased with the way he was doing it because it was very judiciously done. It was apparently appealing to both sides and there was no, no argument about it and he went all the way till he came to a bramble bush. Now the bramble bush was very big and he didn't know what to do because if he went on one side, this village would get more and if he went on the other side, the other village would get more land. So he went over it in the center. In the process, he was lacerated totally. And by the time he reached the end of the uh, road, he was dead. So he has been deified. This little slab is there. It is being worshipped every day. You can see the spiral of the uh, snake and it is being worshipped every day and now they've built a temple on it. So this sort of story of sacrifice, of valour, of no self-interest, a meritorious act is being sacrificed. And the last one that I want to talk about is the is Madhavao near Vad in Vadwan. You can see it's a step well. You can see the entrance to the to the well, and I have shown you a architectural drawing to show you how the steps go down all the way to the bottom. And the, when the water rises, it can rise up to any level, but it is then available to the people. Now the legend about this goes that for twelve years there was no water. There was famine all the way and people were dying and the king was very upset. He didn't know what to do. So then he called an astrologer and said, what can we do to bring some water to this well? So the uh, Joshi said to him that please sacrifice your son and daughter-in-law. That is the only way you will get water in this well. The, prince, the king was very perturbed. He didn't know what to do. He called his eldest son and he said, this is what the, the astrologer says. So the prince said, there is no question. I will sacrifice myself for my people. But he said, it's not just you. It's also your wife. It's a couple that has to go. Sacrifice. The, uh, the astrologer has said, sacrifice your daughter, son and daughter-in-law. Now, the daughter-in-law had a little infant child. And for a moment, she was a little perturbed. But she again said, there is no question. I shall also sacrifice myself. And she said, my sister-in-law will look after my child. So the prince and the prince, his wife, both decided that they will sacrifice themselves. They got dressed in bridal clothes. They stood on top of the well on the appointed day, and then they started going down. As they first came to the level, first level, 
a little bit of moisture could be seen in the mud of the well. Then as they went down, it rose, the water rose up. As they down further, the water rose up. And finally, they were submerged by the water. And all you could see was her veil floating in the water. And then there was enough water for the birds and the beasts and the people of that area. And so these are the sort of legends that are there. These are legends that are inspiring. They're also very culturally informative of a period of people's way of thinking of what they did and how they sacrificed themselves. And my plea to you today after this talk is that let us document these uh, stories, let us document these religious things. They are documented in that area. You know, a lot of the songs, the type that I, I played earlier, remember them, but then you know, songs are also part of intangible heritage, but they get changed as new ideas come. They become filmy songs and they lose that thrust that should be there. So I feel that maybe as in tech, we should really, uh, it draws our attention. We should pay attention to such stories and to such legends and start documenting them and probably make some children's or some books about it so that they are preserved in some form or the other. Because books also may not last, but who knows, we can try our best at this. So that is my plea to you. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I thank everyone for inviting me. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Doshi. Thank you for bringing to our consciousness the idea of working selflessly and making sacrifice in our community. I think this is very required at this moment in time that we have to all work in a selfless in a way so that we give to the community as uh, it's always said that we get so much from our heritage, we must also return something and preserve it for our legacy and for our young people. 